In this lecture, we'll talk about CSS basics. First, we'll talk about CSS and the cascading precedence rules. Then we'll talk about inline, embedded, and external CSS, then color, font, and font size, and span text. CSS stands for cascading style sheets, and it's responsible for how the web page looks or its appearance. When we develop HTML, we're just worried about describing our document. We want this to be um, a heading. We want this to be in our header. We, this should be our navigation. This should be a paragraph. This should be a list, and so on. And that's why we learn all of the tags is to describe our document. Then when we go to CSS, we get to decide how our document looks. And this is a web page called the CSS Zen Garden right here. And with this, we can change the, um, the entire look of the page. This is, um, this is one HTML page with several different CSS style sheets. So this is one style sheet right here, and this is how the web page looks. And then we can click on somebody else who styled this up. Using the exact same HTML file, this is how they made their web page look right here. And so um, as you can tell, he has an entirely different look. It doesn't even look like the same web page. But if you read the text, all the text is the same from the original page. So um, we can try to click on someone else's design right here um, under the C. Here's a different one right here. And uh, maybe Orchard Beauty right here as a different CSS. Um, make them proud right here. And as you can tell, each uh, page looks entirely different, but all of the um, all the text is the same. So CSS has a lot of power to decide how a web page looks. So CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And ca the cascading means the rules of precedence on who gets the final say in how an element appears. So at the lowest precedence, we have browser defaults. And at the highest precedence, we have HTML attributes. And browser defaults are what, how a page should appear without any styling at all. So that's what we've seen in this class. All of our pages haven't had any uh, CSS to make them look different. So we've just been seeing the browser defaults. And we can override the browser defaults with an external style sheet. An external style sheet is stored in a separate file and linked into our page. Um, exter external style sheets are really useful because it, we can uh, have the same style linked into multiple pages. The next highest precedence is embedded styles, and embedded styles are located in the head section of our page. Um, and then inline styles are the next highest precedence, and they're stored with or stored in attributes on the tags themselves. And finally, we have HTML attributes. And we'll not learn about HTML attributes because that was the old way of doing things before CSS uh, came out. Um, so we'll just learn about CSS and we won't learn about the HTML attributes. And in the latest version of HTML, a lot of the attributes have are no longer valid. So we won't learn about HTML attributes. But we will learn about external style sheets, embedded styles, and inline styles. Now, which one will we use most often? We'll actually use the external style sheets the most often. The reason why is because it allows us to style up one page and then store that all in a separate file. And then if we create another page within our site, we can link in the same style sheet and have that page have the same appearance as our first page. And that keeps our site consistent with a nice consistent look. It also has a separation of duty. In um, the HTML file, we describe our document, saying this is a paragraph or this is a heading, and, and so on. And in the CSS file, we decide how our document should look. So that's why we'll use external style sheets. In all of your assignments, you'll be required to include your styles in an external style sheet and not use any of the other methods. I will teach you what the other methods are and how to use them. And at times I might use them um, so I can demonstrate things so that you can see the CSS and the HTML on the same page and it won't be in two separate files. But you should always use external style sheets for your assignments and for any web work that you do. 
So I created a basic HTML page right here. Um, I called it cssdemo.html and um, it just has the basic header, navigation, the main content area and a div tag and a footer down here with um, some links so that they're not really links to other pages but um, pretending that these are links to other pages. And then we have a couple of paragraphs of main content. So I've uh, done a pretty good job at uh, creating this page and we can see this is how it looks um, if we have some content here. But now I want to um, start making this page look different. Now one thing I might want to do is change the color of uh, my CSS demo title, title right here. So I can do that by adding a style attribute right here in the tag. Um, and remember attributes are the, they have a name and an equals and then two quote marks with the value inside. So you can add this style attribute to any tag you see here, except for tags in the head section right here. So you can't add it to here um, because these don't actually appear on the page. So there's no, it doesn't make sense to try to style these up different. And no, you can't style the title. So we can add the style attribute on the body on the header, on the h1, on the nav, on the div, on this h2, the paragraph, and so on. Um, you don't add them on to the closing tag, you add them on to the opening tag right here. So make sure you do it on the opening tag and not the closing tag. So here I can change the color of the text by putting color and then I can say blue like that. Okay, and we'll see. And now we see that this CSS demo has a blue text, a blue color right there. Um, now I can also change the color of this um, header right here by adding a style attribute to that one. And I'll make this one light blue, like that. So now we have a light blue heading right there. So that's how we can style up different text. Now I told you that you can add style to the body and when you apply style to the body, you apply it to the entire page. So if I were to change the color in the body by adding the style tag, and we'll make the color red. Notice that applies to everything except for the two things that I uh, told have a different color. So now we can see the precedence taking, taking over because this is on the specific tag right here. It takes precedence over the style that was set in the body. And this takes precedence over the style that's set by the browser default, which is the black color that we've had. So um, this is also inline style. So they're on the HTML um, tags themselves. So this is inline CSS. And this means that this has a higher precedence than any other kind of CSS that we do. And um, we can uh, style up other things. Here's a background color. And we can make the background light gray of this paragraph. And we can see that there we can see the light gray of the paragraph back there. So this is inline CSS and we'll learn uh, more things that we can do besides change the color and the background color, but we'll just use uh, these two things to learn the basics of CSS. So one problem with inline CSS right here is what if I wanted to make all H1 tags on my page blue? Well, I'd have to find all of my H1 tags and I have one down here as well. Um, and I have an H2 tag right here. I'd have to find all of my H1 tags and add this on there. So that's a lot of repetition right there. So when we do embedded and external uh, CSS, we are really saving ourselves time because we can just declare that we want all H1 tags to be blue and then that will uh, take effect on our entire page instead of us hunting down all of the H1 tags on our page and changing them. So to do embedded CSS, we add a style tag right here and then we end the style tag right there and then we can put our CSS in here but to be able to do this since we're not putting it on the tag that we want we need to use a selector to select the tags we want 
So that will, that's the most difficult part of CSS, is figuring out which selector we want to use. So when I um, use a, a, the selector, we need to say, hey, I want this uh, to apply to H1 tags. So we need to select all H1 tags, and then we apply the style to it. So um, to select a tag by name, we could just put the tag name right there. So when we want all H1 tags right here, and then we can make the color blue right here. So what we uh, put inside of here is exactly the same thing that we put inside of the quote marks right here. So and we can now take this out of here. And we'll save this. And then we'll refresh. And now we can see that this one stayed blue. And then our footer content also turned blue as well, whereas before it was red. So um, the same thing with this body right here. We are styling it with the color red right here. We uh, should take it out of the body tag, and then we can add that right here. And usually you want to put your body tag on the top because this is the style that affects your full page. So then we can go color red right there. And we shouldn't see any difference. Everything is still working the same. And now um, we have our H2 tags that we want to be um, colored in light blue. So we can select all H2 tags and make the color light blue. We should uh, take that out right here as well. And we still have a light blue text. And now um, we can style up our paragraphs and make them the background color light gray. So now we can take all paragraphs and make the background color light gray, just like that. And we refresh, and we go look at this. And now all of our paragraphs have light gray background. So just before we move on, I want to briefly tell you that these are curly braces right here. And you get them by pressing Shift and next to the P on most keyboards there are uh, square brackets if you don't use the shift and curly braces if you do use the shift so you have an opening curly brace right here and a closing curly brace right there so that's how we uh, isolate all of these and we can put more than one property that we want to style up so i can also uh, change the font size um, and make this 12 point font right here and um, it's already a, a 12 point font, but if we were to make this really big, say 18 point font, you can see that the text got all bigger. So um, we can have more than one property inside of uh, these tags. I'll take that away so that we can fit more on our screen right there. And um, back to the question of how do we style up just these two paragraphs and say not these two paragraphs down below? Well. If we look down here, we notice that um, there is a div tag surrounding these two paragraphs in our HTML. I'm going to go ahead and take this div tag out temporarily, right there. And now um, these two paragraphs up here are inside of a div tag. So we have this div tag right here with two paragraphs and this heading tag inside of it. And if I only want to style up these two paragraphs with a light uh, gray background, then I can say select all div tags and inside of the, all of the div tags select any paragraph tag you see so we have a div tag with a paragraph tag inside of it and then this will only apply apply to that and as you can see we no longer have the light gray background uh, around these two paragraphs down here so that's one way that we can uh, use to select um, just certain elements of uh, certain paragraphs and that and not allow other paragraphs however in order to do that you saw that i had to get rid of this div tag right here but what if i wanted that div tag right here we shouldn't be modifying our html so we can style it up um, right or at least uh, not describing our document the right way we can always add more div tags in if we need to style things up better but uh, we shouldn't have to uh, take things out just to style things up. So how can I style up just these two paragraph tags? Well, 
I can do uh, two things. If I just want to select this one, I can do an ID right here. And yeah, remember, this is an attribute, and I can add an ID um, onto any tag um, from the bot inside of this body. We usually don't add IDs onto tags in the head section. But I can add an ID onto any one of these tags, including the body. And when I add this ID, I can come up with any name I want to name this. So I can name this the first paragraph right there. So now I've uh, named this paragraph with this ID called first paragraph. And now up in my styling right here, instead of referring to things by their um, by the tag, I can now refer to it by their IDs. I just need to put a pound sign. So when I see a pound sign, that means I'm looking for things that have an ID um, called whatever I put here. So I'll put first paragraph right here. And again, this is any name that you can uh, think of or want to think of right here. And they just have to match and it's uh, spelling NK. So make sure that they're an exact match. I can't have a capital P right here and a lowercase p down here or else they won't match. So um, we need to match the case and everything. And now when I do that, I just have this paragraph right here. And notice even though I added the div tag back in, these two paragraphs are not affected. So I could add an ID onto this one again. However, this is no longer valid HTML. The reason why it's not valid HTML is that when we give an ID to something, that ID should be unique. So nothing else on this page should have an ID of first paragraph. And plus, this isn't a first paragraph, it's a second paragraph. So I should be calling this the second paragraph. But if I wanted uh, two paragraphs with the same style, instead of an ID, I can use a class. So that's really important. The difference between an ID and a class, a class can have multiple things. So it's OK that we have uh, two classes called first paragraph. And I'm going to rename this so it's not, uh, not wrong. It's just a paragraph. So I can have a class called a paragraph. And maybe I can change this to, say, the main uh, paragraph instead. So now I can have two class, two paragraph tags with the same uh, class name, but I can't have two paragraph tags with the same ID. So when I use a class instead of an ID, when we go to refer to it in the CSS, I have to use a period. So um, the three different things that we have, we can either have the tag name or we can have a pound sign, meaning that we're using an ID, or we can have a period meaning we're using a class. So when I do that, everything with a class is that color. So most of your styling will be done using classes and IDs. So you can just add classes and IDs onto anything, uh, any tag you want, and then use that, those for your CSS when you go to style it to select things out. Um, and another example right here, see this uh, H1 in our footer tag, and then this other H1 is in our header tag. If we want to style them up differently, um, we can use um, the rule that we learned before right here. And this will only apply to H1 tags inside of our header right there. And notice my footer content changed to that. And then I can change H1 tags inside of my footer this way. And I can make the color um, light blue. And I can also take the font size and make it 14 points right there. And now we can see that we changed the H1 tag inside of our footers that way. So those are the ways that we can select different stuff um, on our page. Um, make sure you look at the reading for the CSS selectors to get a uh, more idea of what we can do. Um, I just taught the basic rules right here, but they are sufficient. So you can always add class names or IDs onto your tags and use those in your CSS to specify what you want done. Um, that's very common. Most things are styled up using class names and IDs. So next we want to learn how to 
include external style sheets instead of have our style our style being embedded. So this is embedded style before we learned about inline style when we put it on the attributes. But the style we really, really want to use is an external style sheet. That way we don't have to repeat ourselves in each individual page. We can just include this in one file and then we can link this file into multiple pages and it will style up all those pages the same. So to do that, I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to cut it out and save it on the clipboard and then I'm going to uh, open up a new file right here paste it in just like that and I'm going to save the file on the desktop as cssdemo.css now you can name yours whatever you want but you do need to name it a .css just like uh, before we had to name it .html um, we have to name these files with a .css at the end. If you name your files .txt, then it won't work. You'll just see your source code. You won't see your HTML. So that's really important that we name it .css, and we name our HTML files .html. So now once we do that, we see this right here. And now we need to link that into our web page. So we can get rid of this style tag right here and then link in our uh, CSS page. So we include the rel this is the relation attribute right here. And so what relation does this have to our page? Well, it's the style sheet. And then we have an href, and then I named that cssdemo.css. So this follows the same rules of uh, relative and absolute links when uh, we've done that. So we could start it with an HTTP colon slash slash, or we can put relative pass right here. I usually just save uh, my CSS file and my um, HTML page in the same directory, so I could just put the name right there. And so once I do that, and I save them both, and I refresh, the style should still be there. Now, if your style disappeared, make sure that you have this in the right directory. It has to be in the same folder as the HTML file. And make sure you spelled this right as well. Also, make sure you saved your files. So with that, we have an external style sheet. And it, all you have to do is include this one uh, tag right here on all of our pages in our website. And all of them will have the same style as long as uh, the selectors still work. So one thing um, to make sure is that this link is included in the head section of your web page before uh, you get to the body. And the next thing to make sure, um, or a next, another thing to help you if it's not working, is to go ahead and uh, right click on your web page and click go down to view page source or something like that. Um, and then we'll see this right here. And you should see this right here and you can see that this is a link and you can click on it and you should be able to see your CSS. If you can't do, see your CSS, then you know the problem is with your files. You know that, you know that this uh, doesn't have the right name right here or isn't saved in the right directory. So you want to make sure that your CSS file is saved as this. And remember case does count. So if I used a capital D or a capital C, when I save the file and I put lowercase here, then that would make a difference. And make sure it's in the same directory. So if you can't click on this and see your CSS, then you know that you're, it's not finding the right file. And then if it is finding the right file, but you're not seeing your styling, then something might be wrong with your, um, your selectors right here or the format of your uh, CSS. You might have missed a closing curly brace or you might have uh, missed an ending quote mark or something that uh, really uh, is messing up your web page. So next we'll talk about font. And we can change the font with the font family property right here. And then uh, we just uh, put the font that we want afterwards. So if I want Arial, um, I could just put Arial right there. Um, now we can put it in quote marks if you want as well. That's OK. And if we do this, we refresh, and now we could see that the font changed for everything right here. That's because I put it in the body tag. You might just want to change the font for the H1 tags, 
as well. And then along with those font, you can um, add additional fonts because not every computer will have all of the fonts that you've chosen. Most computers have uh, the basic fonts that, you, that you'll find, but you'll want to add options as backups just in case. So Verdana is another font, a lot like the Arial font. And then we have Sans Serif. And Sans Serif is a generic font family. There are three um, font families, generic font families. One is uh, Serif, one is Sans Serif, and the other one is Monochrome. Um, and those are the three um, generic font families. And um, you can look at the reading uh, for Serif versus uh, Sans Serif. Uh, Arial and Verdana are both Sans Serif fonts. So uh, in our list, we, we want to use Arial first, but if you don't have that, then try to use Verdana. And if you don't have that, then choose a Sans Serif font. And so none of that will have any effect on how our page looks because we have Arial and we'll be able to see this page in Arial. Now, as I said, Arial is a sans serif font. And what that means is, as you can tell, the, the T doesn't have any decoration on it right here, that neither the M or the N. They don't have little decorations on them. And th those decorations are called serif. And so I'm going to snap my fingers and get a sans serif font on here. And so now that I'm using Times New Roman, if you notice, there's spaces in between here. And I believe when there's spaces, you need to use the quote marks around it. So that's why I said it's optional if it's just one word, but if it's more than one word, you need the quote marks. And so this is a serif font, and we can refresh this. And now you can see there's some decorations right here. And usually the decorations help to form a line underneath there. So that helps uh, kind of it makes them there look like there could be a line underneath all of this text right there. And um, so that's what serif fonts are, are good for. And when we're looking on computer screens, serif fonts are actually harder to read than sans serif fonts. So I would uh, probably for the smaller text like this, the paragraph text and stuff like that, you would probably want to use a sans serif font. If you're going to have bigger text for your headings and stuff, then it would be okay to use a serif font. And so that's the font family right there. And I'll refer you to further reading in the, from the lecture notes about more fonts that you can use as well. You might want to try the monochrome font. The monochrome, uh, the monochrome font means that there's uh, the each letter is the same size, and so that's helpful in some situations as well. Next, let's talk about choosing our colors. Um, I've used the color names right here: red, blue, light blue, light blue, and light gray, right here, and that's one way of choosing the colors. And if I, if you look at the reading, you'll see a list of all the different color names that you can use. The most popular way of choosing the color is using a hex code. So it starts with a pound sign, and then a hex is a character between, it has a 0 through 9, the number 0 through 9, and then the letters A through F. And altogether that makes a total of 16 different characters, so we have 0 through 15. And so at 9, the next one would be A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. So that, those are the hex uh, characters, and then we get two of them for each color, our red, our green, and our blue, which are the primary colors. And out of those colors, we can mix them together and we can create any color we want. So if I want a really red color, then I'll put two Fs, so that's 15 and 15 right there. So that's two Fs and then zero for our green and zero for our blue. And I'll save that. And now we get a really bright red. Now, if I wanted a really bright green instead, I can put all green color right there. And now we have a really bright green. And then lastly, we can have a really bright blue color right there. And there's a bright blue. And then if we want to mix them, if we mix red and blue together with no green, then we get purple. And if we didn't want it so bright, maybe we can add a little bit less red. So we'll just do 99 right there and 99 a little less green. And we'll still have our purple, but it won't be quite as bright. So um, that's how we choose colors with the hex code right there. Um, we can um, add in a little bit of uh, green right there, kind of change the shade of purple. We can't really see the difference in that right there. But that's how you can choose colors using a hex code. Now there is a short hex code, 
And um, if you notice, I always chose the same two characters for this. I don't have to. I could choose a 9-0 instead. I don't know if you'll be able to tell much of a difference in that color. Um, but if you do choose the same two characters, um, then like that. If we do choose the two same characters, then you can take out the second one of each one. So this limits your options. Now you just have 0 through 15 for each of the three colors. But um, when you do this, then um, you have the hex short code right there. And I'll be free to the reading for more information about the hex short code, but it's just um, 909 is the same thing as 9900. Nine, nine. So then um, the next option you have is um, RGB, which is the same thing um, for choosing the colors, except for we use some different syntax. And instead of using hex codes 0 through F, we can now use a number uh, um, between 0 and 255. So if I wanted a really red color, that would be red, green, and blue right there. So this color should be really red. And then if I put the 255 here, then we'd have a really green color and then a really blue color right there. And of course you can mix and match them. So 150 and 150, and that should give us the same purple color we have right there. The last uh, model is uh, hue, saturation, and luminosity. It's not really popular, but you do have it. It's actually um, easier to pick the color you want when you use this if you knew what value standing for uh, the hue that you wanted to. So the hue is the base color. The S stands for saturation, so that's um, how much gray or how much uh, color shines through. And the luminosity is how bright it is. So when we do this, we have a number between 0 and 360. Not 260, but 360. And that's the color will. So we can uh, choose any number we want between 0 and 360. And the final two are the percentages. So how um, how much saturation do we want? Maybe we want 80% 80, 80 saturated with a luminosity of 80% right there. So um, as you can tell, uh, 360 is probably the color for red. So if we had 100% saturation, probably get closer to a red and maybe some more um, luminosity maybe 95 percent luminosity right there actually that kind of makes it uh, darker so maybe we need less luminosity 25 percent right there and then we have a, a deep um, red so you can see the luminosity is kind of how bright it is so um, if we go all the way down to zero then it's not bright at all and we have a black color so this is completely black and then if we go all the way up to 100% then we have a completely white color and it just disappears so because the background's white too so that's a uh, luminosity hue saturation luminosity and I'll refer you to the reading to for more information on that one so your um, methods are you can use the color name you can use the hex code, which is the most popular, using the pound and then six hex characters. And then you have the short code, which is pound and three hex characters. Then you have the RGB and the hue saturation luminosity. So the last thing I'll say about color is you really want to pick um, good color schemes. And uh, there's tools on the web to help you pick good color schemes. So make sure you go to the lecture notes. Um, there are several sites that will help you pick uh, good color schemes and some sites that tell you about um, what kind of colors you might want to pick. And um, this um, is a color scheme designer, so it allows you to see different colors that work really well together. And um, you can choose different options to choose different color options as well. So make sure you go to these uh, sites and play around and, and please, please pick good colors. You want a good high contrast between your text and the background. And if you're going to have a, a text that you want uh, a lot of people to read, like a paragraph, it probably should be black text on a white background. Or maybe if you're look, going for another look, it should be white text on a black background. Um, white text or black text on a white background is the easiest uh, text to read 
and probably the safest uh, choice.